So glad you could join me. I'm going to be reading a story tonight, and it's going to be called The Marvelous Adventures. Let's get to the first page here. Oh, the Marvelous Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey by Ingersoll Lockwood. He's also the author of Travels and Adventures of Little Baron Trump and his wonderful dog, Bulger, and author of Wonderful Deeds and Doing of Little Giant, Boab and his talking raven. Can't see that. Tabib and Extraordinary Experiences of a Little Captain Doa Cup on the Shores of Bubble Land, etc. Illustrated by Howard Johnson. Okay, Mommy can only read one chapter tonight, okay? And I I will um, just keep uploading this as we go, okay? So, let's start with the copyright in 1892. The copyright has expired. Biographical notice of William Henrik Sebastian von Trump, commonly called Little Baron Trump. As doubting Thomases seem to take particular pleasures in popping up on all occasions, Jack in the Box like, it may be it, it may be well to head them off in this particular instance by proving that Baron Trump was a real Baron and not a mere Baron of the mind. The family was originally French Huguenot, de la Trump, which upon revocation of the Edict of Nantes in 1685 took refuge in Holland, where its head assumed the name Van der Trump just as many other of French Protestants rendered their names to the Dutch. Some years later, upon the invitation, invitation of the elector of Brandenburg, Nicholas von der Trump, became a subject of that prince and purchased a large estate in the province of Pomerania, again changing his name this time to von Trump. The little baron, so called for his dimin diminutive stature, was born some time in the latter part of the 17th century. He was the last of his race in the direct line, although his cousins of his are today well-known Pomeranian gentry. He began his travels at an incredibly early age and filled his castle with such strange objects picked up here and there in the faraway corners of the world that the simple-minded peasantry came to look upon him as a half bigwig and half magician. Hence the growth of many myths and fanciful stories concerning this indefatigable globetrotter. The date of his death cannot be fixed with any certainty, but this much may be said. Among the portraits of Pomeranian notables hanging in the Rathaus at Seton, there is one picturing a man of low stature and with a head much too large for his body, he is dressed in some outlandish costume and holds in his left hand a grotesque image in ivory most elaborately carved. The broad face is full of intelligence and the large gray eyes are light, lighted up with a good-natured but quizzical look that invariably attracts attention. The man's right hand rests upon the back of a dog 
sitting on a table and looking straight out with an air of dignity that shows that he knew he was sitting for his portrait. If a visitor asks the guide who this man is, he always gets for answer, Oh, that's a little baron. But little baron who? That's the question. Why may it not be the famous Wilhelm Heinrich Sebastian von Trump, commonly called Little Baron Trump, and his wonderful dog Bulger? Chapter 1 Page 1. Bulger is greatly annoyed by the familiarity of the village dogs and the presumption of the house cats. His health suffers terribly, and he implores me to set out on my travels again. I readily consent, for I had been reading of the world within a world in a musty old miss written by the learned Dom Fum, parting interviews with Elder Baron and the gracious Baroness, my mother, preparations for departure. Chapter 2, uh, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, wait, 20, 20, 21, 22, boy, this is quite the story. I think the less president's shorter. Okay, we'll, 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 we'll do this, though. I thought this was going to be shorter. Okay, so, the marvelous underground journey. Polker is greatly annoyed by the familiarity of the village dogs and the presumptuous, the presumptuous, Presumption of the house cats. His health suffers terribly, and he implores me to set out on, tra on my travels again. I readily consent, for I had been reading of the world within a world, in a musty old mis written by the learned Don Fum, parting interviews with the elder baron and the gracious baroness, my mother. Preparations for departure. Bulger was not himself at all, dear friends. There was a lackluster look in his eyes, and his tail responded with only a half-hearted wag when I spoke to him. I say half-hearted, for I always had a notion that the other end of Bulger's tail was fastened to his heart. His appetite, too, had gone down with his spirits, and he rarely did anything more than sniff the dainty food which I set before him, although I tried to tempt him with fried chicken livers and toasted cocks, combs, and two of his favorite, uh, two of his favorite dishes, excuse me. There was evidently something on his mind, and yet it never occurred to me what that something was, for to be honest about it, it was something which of all things, I never should have dreamed of finding there. Possibly I might have discovered at an earlier day what it was all about, had it not been that just at this time it was very busy, too busy in fact, to pay attention to anyone, even to my dear four-footed foster brother. As you may remember, dear friends, my brain is a very active one, and when I once became interested in a subject, Castle Trump itself might take fire and burn until the legs of my chair had become charred before, I would hear the noise and confusion, or even smell the smoke. It so happened at the time of Bulger's low spirits that the elder baron had, through the kindness of an old friend, come into possession of a 15th century manuscript from the pen of no less celebrated thinker and philosopher than the learned Spaniard Don Constantino Bartomalo Streplofigenerificum, commonly known among scholars as Dom Fum, entitled 
a world within a world. In this work, Dom Fum advanced the wonderful theory that there is every reason to believe that the interior of our world itself is inhabited. That is well known. This vast earth ball is not solid. On the contrary, being in many places quite hollow, that ages and ages terrible disturbances had take, taken place on its surface and had driven the inhabitants to seek refuge in these vast underground chambers, so vast in fact, as well to merit the name of World Within a World. This book, with its crumpled, torn, and time-stained leaves, exhaling the odors of vaulted crypt and worm-eaten chest, exercised a peculiar fascination upon me. All day long, and often far into the night, I sat poring over its musty and mildewed pages, quite forgetful of this surface world, and with the plummet of thought sounding within subterranean depths, and with the eye and ear of fancy, visiting them and gazing upon and listening to the dwellers therein. While I would be thus engaged, Bulger's favorite position was on a quaintly embroidered leather cushion brought from the Orient by me on one of my journeys and now placed on the end of my work table nearest the window. From this point of vantage, Bulger, excuse me, Bulger commanded a full view of the park and the terrace and the drive leading up the porte cochere. Nothing escaped his watchful eye. Here he sat hour by hour, amusing himself by noting the comings and goings of all sorts of folk, from the hawkers of the googos, googos to the noblest people in the Shire. One day my attention was attracted by his suddenly leaping down from his cushion and giving a large growl of displeasure. I paid little heed to it, but to my surprise the next day, about the same hour it occurred again. My curiosity was now thoroughly aroused in laying down Dom Fum's musty man's manuscript I hastened to the window to learn the cause of Bulger's irritation. Lo, the secret was out. There stood half a dozen mongrel curs belonging to the tenantry of the baronical lands, or baronial lands, looking up the window and by their barking and annex endeavoring to entice Bulger out for a romp. Dear friends, need I assure you that such familiarity was extremely distasteful to Bulger? Their impudence was just a little more than he could stand. Ringing my bell, I directed my servant to hunt them away, whereupon Bulger consented to resume his seat by the window. The next morning, just as I had settled myself down for a good long read, I was almost started by, startled by Bulger, bounding into the room with his eyes flashing, fire and teeth lay bare in anger. Laying hold of the skirt of my dressing gown, he gave it quite a savage tug, which meant, put the book aside, little master, and follow me. I did so. He led me down the stairs, across the hallway, into the dining room, and then hit this new cause of discontent on his part became very apparent to me. There, grouped around his silver breakfast plate, sat an ancient tabby cat and four kittens, all calmly licking or lapping away at his breakfast. <gasps> Looking into my face, 
he uttered a sharp complaining howl, as much to say, There, little master, look at that, isn't that enough to royal the patience of a saint? Canst thou wonder that I am not happy with all these disagreeable things happening to me? I tell thee, little master, it is too much for flesh and blood to put up with. And I thought so too, and did all in my power to comfort my unhappy little friend. But judge of my surprise upon reaching my room and directing him to take place on his cushion, to see him refuse to obey. It was something extraordinary and set me to thinking. He noticed this and gave a joyful bark, then dashed into my sleeping apartment. He was gone for several moments and then returned bearing in his mouth a pair of oriental shoes, which he laid at my feet. Again and again he disappeared, coming back each time with some article of clothing in his mouth. In a few moments, he had laid a complete oriental costume on the floor before my eyes. And would you believe me, dear friends? It was the identical suit which I had worn on my last travels in the faraway lands when he and I had been wrecked on the island of Gogola, the land of the round bodies. What did it mean? Why, this to be sure. Little master, canst thou not understand thy dear Bulker? He is weary to this dull and spiritless existence. He is tired of this increasing familiarity on the part of these mongrel curs of the neighborhood and of the audacity of these kitten tabbies and their families. He implores thee to break away from this life of reverie and inaction, and for the honor of the trumps to be up and away again, stooping down and winding my arms around my dear Bulgar, I cried out, Yes, I understand thee now, faithful companion, and I promise thee that before this moon has filled her horns, we shall once more turn our backs on Castle Trump, up and away, in search of the portals of To Don Thumb's world within a world. Upon hearing these words, Bulger broke out into the wildest, maddest, barking, bounding hither and thither as if the very spirit of mischief had suddenly nestled in his heart in the midst of these mad gambols. A low rap on my chamber door caused me to call out, Peace, peace, good Bulger. Someone knocks. Peace, I say. It was Elder Baron with somber mien and stately tread he advanced and took a seat beside me on the canopy welcome honored father i explained i took his hand and raised it to my lips i was upon the very point of seeking me out he smiled and then said well little baron what thinkest thou of Don Fum's world within a world? I think, my lord, was my reply, that Don Fum is right, that such a world must exist, and with thy consent, it is my intention to set out in search of its portals with all safe haste, and as soon as my dear mother, the gracious baroness, may be able to bring her heart to part with me. The elder baron was silent for a moment and then added, Little baron, 
much as thy mother and I shall dread to think of thy being again out from under the safe protection of this venerable wolf, the moss-grown tiles of which has sheltered so many generations of trumps, yet must we not be selfish in this matter, heaven forbid, that such a thought should move our souls to stay thee. The honor of our family, thy fame an explorer of strange lands in faraway corners of the globe, call unto us to be a strong-hearted. Therefore, my dear boy, make ready and go forth once more in search of new marvels. The learn done funds chart or thumbs will stand thee by like a safe trusty counselor. Remember, little Baron, the motto of the Trumps per Arda ad Astra. The pathway to glory is strewn with pitfalls and dangers. But the comforting thought shall ever be mine that when thy keen intelligence fails, Bulger's unerring instinct will be there to guide thee. As I stoop to kiss the elder baron's hand, the gracious baroness entered the room. Bulger hastened to raise himself upon his hind legs and lick her hand in token of respectful greeting. The tears were pressing against her eyelids, but she kept them back and encircling my neck with her loving arms, she pressed many and many a kiss upon my cheeks and brow. I know what it all means, my dear son, she murmured with the saddest of smiles. But it never shall be said that Gertrude, Baroness von Trump, stood in the way of her son, adding new glories to the family. Suchin, go, little Baron, and heaven bring thee safely back to our arms and to our hearts in its own good time. At these words, Bulger, who had been listening to the conversation with pricked up ears and glistening eyes, gave one last howl of joy and then springing into my lap, excuse me, covered my face with kisses. This is done. He vented his happiness in a string of ear-splitting barks and a series of maddest gambols. It was one of the happiest and proudest days of his life, for he felt that he had exerted considerable influence in screwing to the sticking point my resolution to set out my travels once again. And now the patter of hurrying feet and the loud murmur of anxious voices resounded through the castle corridors, while inside and out, ever and anon, I could hear the cry now, whispered and now outspoken, the little baron is making ready to leave home again. Volga ran hither and thither, surveying everything, taking note of all the preparations, and I could hear his joyous bark ring out as some familiar article used by me on my former journeys was dragged from his hiding place twenty times a day my gentle mother came to my room to repeat some good counsel or reiterate some valuable caution it seemed to me that I had never seen her so calm so stately so lovable she was very proud of my great name, and so, in fact, were every man, woman, and child in the castle. Had I not gotten off as I did, I should have been literally killed with kindness and vulgar slain with sweet cake. End of chapter one. So we'll be visiting chapter two tomorrow. Thank you for listening. 
and take care. Love you lots. Good night. Bye.